Okay, I'm John Simmons from Microsoft, a media platform architect, which is just my way of, you know, I'm actually a program manager, but I found that people didn't listen to me when I said I'm a program manager, so I made up the title, uh, media platform architect. And uh, before I get started, I want to find out what people know. How many people have heard of the WAVE project? So, okay, some, yeah, how about CMath? Anyone know about that? Everyone knows about that, practically. Common encryption, the common encryption spec. Okay, um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief history of WAVE, how it came about. I think it's important to understand how it came about because sometimes understanding where things come from helps you understand the kind of the organic nature of the thing. Uh, and I'll talk about the relationship of WAVE to global media standards like CMAF and EME and MSC and, and SCUDI 35 and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, then I'm going to talk about you know, who's, who's involved in WAVE, what, what they're doing, and we'll talk about specifically what WAVE is doing around content, around applications and devices, and then kind of talk a little bit about the future of that activity. So this is, this is kind of the, and some of you who know me from 2008 know that there was a project at Microsoft where we uh, set about, this is before there was DRM interoperability, before the, all encoding formats, uh, that are DRM enabled had a different format. So if you used this DRM or that DRM, you'd have to use an entirely different file and you couldn't decrypt them commonly. So we started a project in October of 2008 saying, well, how would you make interoperable uh, media um, the same as if uh, it was in the clear? You know, what, what would it take to make the whole stack? And it wasn't just uh, common encryption, it was everything all the way up to HTML5. What would have to exist in there so that you could just stream media but still have the, uh, the constraints of saying, well, you know, if I produced, if I spent $100 million to make this movie, I have some control over access. And um, that was in 2008. Then, of course, all these things happened. Uh, after that, we published a specification for um, uh, uh, common encryption, which is where where that came from out of that 2008 project. Uh, we went with Apple to the W3C and proposed um, uh, that all of this ought to be baked into HTML5. This is when we also, there was a proposal from MPEG, this, uh, let's uh, produce an adaptive streaming standardization. We actually uh, published the smooth streaming transport protocol in hopes that maybe that would become the standard, and, but it turned out there were lots of offers of proposals that Dash eventually came out of that. Uh, a lot of people at, I don't know if anyone knows uh, uh, Harry Pyle and, right, and uh, late Harry Pyle, he's not with us anymore, Scott Firestein. These are people at Microsoft who worked on that. Quentin Burns, who's still at Microsoft, uh, also did. Um, so kind of racing ahead, uh, we eventually saw HTML5 EME MSC appear uh, as published specifications. And then in 2015, Microsoft and Apple had been working on a collaboration to enable HLS to use fragmented MP4 and be interoperable with Dash. And, uh, and I think Apple basically saw the writing on the wall. They had to move to a fragmented MP4 structure for linear uh, uh, streaming and for on-demand on streaming. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, we actually uh, uh, brought the CMAF proposal. That's what it was called, CMF at the time it became CMAF. Uh, we brought that proposal to MPEG for standardization with all those companies, which I won't read to you. Uh, BAMTech is now Disney Streaming. And, you know, at the time it was MLB Advanced Media doing baseball stuff. And, uh, and at the same time, the CTA uh, 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 came to me. They'd come to me actually the, uh, the previous year, uh, having read the paper I published at NAB uh, on how all this stack could disrupt the industry, but how we need to get the industry together to kind of figure out how devices talk to services and how they adopt HTML5 correctly, uh, that that's where the WAVE project came from, from that paper in 2014. Uh, so the first uh, WAVE meeting took place at CES in 2016. The first technical working group meeting took place then, and then there have been a number of publications that have taken place. And I'm going to now, now that you kind of understand how it came about, what it was about, 
is uh, what we'll talk about next. These are all the standards in that 2008 proposal. We didn't have names for all these things, but we kind of knew the pieces, right? There had to be some common encryption, some sort of uh, encoding format, that people, a container format people could agree to standardize on, um, some standard for adaptive streaming. Uh, turns out we're going to end up with two because there are these two dominant standards out there that are still kind of taking up half the market. And uh, some way of making it plug into HTML5. There are some more standards in here for media capabilities that Google's been promoting that we're working with them on that I'll, we'll talk about a little bit. And also uh, stuff that enables uh, progressive web apps, which is something that Joey's going to talk about in a few minutes. So those are the standards. I want to briefly mention, I already touched on this, why common encryption. I'm just going to touch on a couple of these standards and why they're important. The first one is the common encryption standard because without that, none of this is possible. I mean, you're, you, would be, you would either have to have one DRM for the planet, and everyone would have to use that one DRM, and it would be some, you know, kind of, well, it's unimaginable because there are legal aspects to that. Or you had to have some way of having them all use some common standard so you can, multiple DRMs could decode the same content. So once that was done, that made it possible to go where we're going now with uh, large-scale distribution of media over the web. Um, CMAF, this was a 18-month effort between Microsoft and Apple. We sat down with their engineers, Roger Pantos. It was actually John Deutscher talked to Roger Pantos and said, hey, let's start this project. And then, uh, then it became sort of a Windows-driven thing in large part for quite some time. Uh, and this, this uh, specification uh, became much more than what it was originally. Originally, it was just make it such that we've codified the best practices for fragmented MP4 delivery and just sort of write a spec that everyone can kind of snap to. But then when people got involved, they started saying, we need to add features for low latency. We need to add features for um, uh, expand, expanding it to non-MPEG codecs. And all of this capability was got, ended up uh, ending up in the spec before it became published in uh, January of this year. Uh, it was pretty much done last year, but ISO is, is very uh, slow in getting things done. I didn't note what time I started, but uh, David. I'll keep you honest. You, know, you keep me honest here. So um, the other thing, of course, is this issue about adaptive streaming. So uh, H folks know there's HLS and there's Dash, and now HLS used to only be transport stream. Now it supports uh, fragmented MP4 in CMAF format. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and there's a reason why that's very important. And that has to do with, and I stole this slide from uh, Will Law at Akamai because he does cute graphics and stuff. So when you're doing encoding in the cloud, if you're streaming content from glass to glass, you don't want to have multiple copies of everything making its way through the network. It, it congests the network. It means your CDNs are less efficient. It means, I mean, and your clients are non-interoperable. You really need to get to a point where you've made that as common across the board. That's why I was asking Alex the question about SCSI 35 and standardization, because suddenly you're having to put custom clients on every device, every set-top box and every TV set that's going to be capable of handling these new media services is going to have to have a special app that gets downloaded on it to handle the, the special way that that particular service is running. What you really want to do is to make as much of that common as possible. And that's why uh, uh, moving the CMAF enabled HLS and Dash to, to basically be manifest to be produced for both uh, the same content. And there's a lot of work going on in the WAVE project that I'll talk about in a second to uh, ensure that when you produce CMAF content, it'll work with both HLS and DASH, especially for linear cases with ads insertion and so forth. And then lastly, there's the work that's taking place in the HTML5 world, which is for encrypted media extensions, media source extensions. This is, uh, was originally Google. Uh, and Microsoft and Netflix meeting in Kirkland. Um, it's actually a very amusing story, which I'm happy to tell you about 
after my talk, if you come by during the social, about all of that and, and the resulting uh, kind of uh, Guy Fox uh, mask type behavior that occurred as a result of us bringing EME to the web. But uh, the important thing to understand is, is that this has enabled uh, a, a platform that can be adopted across all industries that will be able to consume commercial media. And a it's not done, there's more work to be done, but it's, it's very much the thing. HTML5 will be the way commercial media is distributed across the web. I think it's pretty clear that's what's gonna happen. Uh, so now let's talk about Wave. So Wave, Wave is sort of like, sort of the beginning there's this idea, hey, if we kind of create standards for commercial media distribution, then we can make something big happen. Uh, all these standards got created, but now you have to get uh, industry participants, device manufacturers and, uh, and, um, and uh, service providers, content producers, uh, encoding houses, you got to get everyone to agree on how they're going to use the standards because standards tend to be a little broader and you need to trim them a bit to make them actually practical. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the work that WAVE is doing. So it's doing specification work which is not writing new standards, it's saying, hey, let's, how do we use the existing standards? So we're not actually publishing any standards. It addresses global web media interop issues by the, saying, Here, here's how to use these standards and how they should be used on embedded devices. And specifically, it looks at encoding issues, saying, look, we can trim back, if we just look at all of the sta standardized on CMAF, defined media profiles, which are basically how you bind a particular codec inside of a CMAF container. They get published uh, in MPEG, but they also get published in Etsy and other organizations. The Alliance for Open Media has published a binding spec for AV1 for uh, CMAF. So get, let's get together, let's define which media profiles meet the criteria of of uh, market acceptance, enough support in the industry. Let's publish a spec that is sort of a cookbook saying here are the media profiles and that's what Wave is doing. On the platform side, it's um, from a publication perspective because embedded devices tend not to be evergreen. I don't know if er everyone know this term evergreen from a browser perspective. It means it's sort of what all the browser companies say, hey look, uh, don't publish uh, snapshots you know, just the browser should just be kind of continuously updating. So it's always getting up to date. And because it's online, it's going to get updated. Well, you put a browser on a TV set, that's it. It's baked. And the TV manufacturer is not going to create a service, most of them, to update that browser. So at least you need to tell the TV manufacturer, here's the API surface you need to expose to consume commercial media. So that Wave is doing that. They've published the first draft of that. There'll be another publication uh, this year. Um, playback issues. Uh, we'll talk about these more, but there are lots of playback issues that can occur, uh, especially when you start talking about wanting to be able to leave a device on 24-7 streaming sporting events. Uh, does it have memory problems? Does it have glitches, ad signaling events? Does it splice condition problems at, between ad boundaries? Uh, so all of these things are being specified. But how to, how to, and more importantly, how to test for compliance with requirements around device playback. And uh, all the specs that have been published and are going to be published are free. So you just go to this website and download them. They're PDFs. Uh, some of the specs are, H, are actually being done in the W3C. W3C is a member of Wave. Uh, the other thing that WAVE is doing is it's engaging with the, comp with the organizations that are producing these standards. So we're going back and saying, hey, look, CMAF is great, but it's missing the following features. So it's already happened now. We've already seen three amendments flow in the process of flowing out of MPEG that were came from uh, WAVE. And it's not surprising because the same people are in WAVE or in MPEG. So, you know, they, they hear the problems and they run down the street and fix them, and then it comes back. Um, platform improvements, HTML5, EMEMSC, people are saying, hey, it can't 
tell what media profile I'm talking. It does this device support this media profile. It's use can play type or is type supported and I get a maybe. You know, that's not good enough. You have to do some improvements and there's a lot of work going on right now, but a lot of feedback from Wave to the people doing that work. And, uh, uh, and of course, as I said, playback improvement, test suites, and so on. So here's a pitch about joining Wave. <laughs> if you're a member of CTA, if you're, if you're in it, working for a company that's a member of CTA, it doesn't cost you anything to become part of the Wave project. Uh, here's a little organizational chart. And the only reason I included this is because probably some of you know these people. Will Law at Akamai is the technical chair of the working group. Uh, I chair the content spec task force. Thomas Stockhammer at Qualcomm uh, is uh, chairing the device playback. And Mark Vickers from Comcast is uh, chairing the HTML5 API task force. Uh, lots of people involved in these activities. This is the list of the companies who are involved. I, I think this is really important to note that it's pretty much everybody, you know, kind of. There's some people who have joined that I can't put on this list yet from uh, Asia that just joined the last week. So it's growing. It's a, a very uh, uh, significant effort, especially from folks like the BBC who have provided like uh, really good feedback. So what, is, uh, what do we do in the content spec? We basically are taking uh, media profiles, you know, the CMAP spec lists lots of media profiles. We created over a nine month period of debate a objective criteria for approving a media profile to be added to our spec in terms of market acceptance and who cares about, is it in use today? Or, are there devices or services using it today? And is it, and is it available with a CMAF binding? Is there a C, published CMAF binding people could read? And then we put these together to produce a, a content specification, which you can download from that website. And it lists all of these video and audio uh, media profiles that people could uh, snap to. This, I'm not going to read this. This is an example uh, from the, it's also very similar to what's in the CMAP spec itself. And the same thing for audio profiles. A lot of the audio profiles are coming from Etsy because Dolby and uh, DTS uh, are not going to get their profiles published in MPEG for reasons that are political. Uh, they would like to, but it won't happen. So, um, and of course, uh, the Alliance for Open Media is publishing profiles as well. Uh, the other thing that WAVE is, one of the feedback, part of the feedback that came from WAVE to CMAF was uh, sp splice conditioning problems. So I've got a presentation profile, which is a collection of media profiles. I'm watching a presentation. It's a TV show. And it has a beginning, middle, and end, like any story. And it, when it ends, then I got some other show that starts right after that. Might be an ad inserted after that. These are two entirely different presentations. CMAP doesn't say what happens at that juncture. Well, how do you do splice conditioning? How do you know that the device you're talking to can handle the transition from this presentation to the next? And we characterize that in WAVE as a, as a program, sequence of presentations as a program. It's just a, a term that a lot of people don't like. But the bottom line is it's a sequence of presentations with some rules about how to handle the switching uh, sets. That language is in the spec today, the CMAF, uh, the WAVE content spec, but it's also being cha it's changing the CMAF spec. CMAF is going to adopt rules around splice conditioning, which I think will be very helpful uh, moving forward. Uh, on the HTML5 side, I mentioned earlier that these TV sets are not going to update their uh, API surface. Uh, so what we're doing is we're saying, look, it's all CMAF, and devices don't all use HTML5, but our reference uh, platform is HTML5. And we're going to create a whole bunch of tests to test your device against all of the requirements that are coming from the content spec, device playback spec, and the HTML5 API spec. And uh, uh, we're going to do all that testing for you without having you having to write a single test, 
unless you don't support HTML5 and you're supporting your own platform, then you can take the test and you could just, the requirements of the test, you just have to write them yourself. But at least you'll be able to say, I'm compliant with the WAVE requirements. Um, uh, in case you're wondering, there's no logo program. Nobody's being charged for this. We're going to make all these tests publicly available. The CMAF uh, validator that was paid for by Microsoft and Apple uh, is also part of the Dash Industry Forum uh, effort. It's a collaboration. And that validator is going to be publicly available. You just take your content and point, point your content at this validator and say, I think it's, I'm a valid CMAF binding for blah and it'll tell you what problems you have. Um, so, and then I mentioned there was this annual web media API spec. There's one published already. They just went through and looked at all the browsers that are popular today and say, what are they using, supporting in common? And said, well, that should be what we're going to standardize on. Now, obviously, there are problems. Media capability. Uh, that is now supported in Chrome uh, today. It's not behind a flag, but it isn't necessarily the one that will be the same as what will be supported across all browsers. It'd probably be some evolution there. Um, but obviously, you need that. You know, the media capabilities that are present in HTML5 today are insufficient. So next year, we expect this, the spec to improve, devices to improve, and get better and better at reporting their capabilities. Um, uh, there's a not yet published guideline for web media uh, app developers. This is something Joey and I actually chatted about briefly last month. This is something that's really needed. What we really need is a lot of code samples. Uh, I think that would be the best. And, uh, and like that. Let me see. Let me. I'm not going to read this to you. Actually, are we going to make slides available to folks? Okay, I'll, I'll make these available so you can read through all this stuff instead of me uh, uh, blathering on. I'll step through that. This is about device playback. So I want to get to uh, this next topic. Uh, this is a list. It's probably not complete of all the different players that are out there today. So okay, so you got lots of places you can start. And a lot of these players, I mean, the Shaka player is sort of, to me, is the gold standard. I mean, I hope that doesn't annoy anyone. I know it doesn't make Joey unhappy, but, uh, but there are lots of players out there, and people are working to improve them. But the real key here is, is that the players need to stay current with the changes that are happening in the HTML5 API surface, as well as in the content and so forth. But uh, we believe that progressive web apps are going to be very important to the future of this media space. And I know that uh, Joy's going to talk about this a little bit later, so I'm not going to delve into this. But I think it's important for you to have that in the back of your mind, that when you're thinking about HTML5 applications, or thinking about native applications, so you start thinking about HTML5 as a means of constructing your native application. Because uh, 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 Microsoft is supporting this today. Uh, Google supporting it, and we both. Hmm? And Mozilla and today. Apple and and Apple. Oh, that's great news! I didn't know that. For all devices or just uh, iOS? Um, I believe just iOS. Oh, just iOS. So progressive web apps should, and Joey will talk more about them. So okay, so here's the last thing. Why why did Wave get created? Right. What was the whole? What was the, why did, what, why did the paper I published cause the CTA to come ask me to have breakfast with them and say, hey, why don't we create this WAVE project? And it was because of this um, slide that I had in uh, the paper I published at NAB. This is uh, the number of hosts worldwide uh, back in the 80s. And there's this little spike there in 1989. There's an inflection point, and that's when AT&T made TCP IP public domain. So everyone said, hey, I can just get TCP IP, put it on my device, and now I've got the internet, right? I don't have to, and I can, oh, I can also network all my computers in my office, and I don't have to pay 
Banyan Vines or whatever, all these different companies, they were toast at that point because every device is going to come pre-enabled for internet access and local network access. And that was because of what AT&T did. And uh, World Wide Web, so I'm older than probably almost everyone in this room. In 1990, there was one website in the world. It was in Geneva. In 1992, there were 26 websites. One of them was a website listing the other 25 websites. And they flew around the world with a floppy. And they would hand it to people at research labs, say, hey, put this, you can use the internet to talk to us and get graphics. And it was all physics. It was all, that was what Tim Berners-Lee was working on. He was at CERN, right? Um, but then, by 97, there were over a million websites. And you can see something happened here. And what happened here was uh, Mosaic. You know, once there was Mosaic, suddenly you had this big spike because you've decoupled the server from the client. Interoperability can have this effect on media. So if you look at the transport, 1993, the transport protocol, HTML, uh, a portable browser, mobility of internet experience. There it is, right? You can just take those things, put them together, and suddenly you get a big spike. Now take common media application format and <coughs> Dash, uh, or HLS, and uh, these HTML, HTML5 standards like EME and MSE, and progressive web apps, and now you have mobility of web media experience. So my expectation is, is that in the coming years, we're going to see this large-scale growth of commercial media services on the web. And I know we're done. but And there, this means a lot of long-tail content. It means every sports franchise becomes a channel, a live linear channel on the web. And devices will be able to incorporate this capability uh, for um, all these devices, it will be an explosion of devices. Oh, we're at 120 billion devices now, or whatever it is. And so all of them are going to be IP enabled. They're going to be consuming media. And this is why I think it's an important thing. So when I give you the deck, uh, you'll get these references for all these specs, so you can take a look at them. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah.